You're listening to Big Blend Radio, Champagne Sundays with Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, the crazy mother-daughter team and publishers of Big Blend magazines. And you just heard Mary Celeste, and it's featured on the third album by prog rock keyboardist, guitarist, composer, author Tim Morris. And we're super excited to have him on the show today. I encourage you to go to his website, timmorris.com. You can also go to get his album, Tim Morris 3, on Amazon, CD Baby, iTunes, you name it. Nancy, do you want to make a movie now? Uh, yeah, I was could, it, listening I could, to that. I was actually thinking of painting a picture, painting from that. Oh wow, that would be yeah. cool. That would be cool. Tim, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm pleased to be here today. Hey, we're excited to have you on the show. This is such an epic album. I feel like it's like a really cool journey of. I just feel like I should travel with it, but I want to fly. <laughs> Normally, it's road trip music, but with you, I feel like it should be like on a magic carpet ride or something. Well, I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I uh I'm hopeful that that the listener has that sort of experience. It was very important to me in this album uh to really hone down into the emotional content of the songs and so 
you know, if you're feeling something, if it's moving you in some way, then I feel like I've done my job. Right on. Mm. I want to know how you write all this. I mean, because I know that <laughs> keyboards, guitar, you started out on guitar, then went to keyboards, right, and, and piano. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I started out as a guitarist. I begged my mom for a guitar when I was nine years old and then, you know, promptly didn't play it like most most kids that age, right? You get the instrument and then you sit around and yeah, eventually yeah. you get around to taking the lessons and getting some practice time in and it all starts to come together. But yeah, I started playing piano in high school and um, as far as, you know, writing goes, it comes any number of ways. Like with the Mary Celeste, the song you just played, mm. I was thinking about um, I was thinking about loss and uh, how sudden loss is it can be the most difficult to process. Particularly, I had an uncle who passed away very suddenly, very unexpectedly, and um, I, you know, I wanted to find the right way mm. to approach it, and I decided, oh, I could use the story of the Mary Celeste, which, if your listeners don't know it, they can Google it and find out. Um, but it's this, you know, enduring mystery as to what happened to the crew of the Mary mm. Celeste, and they seem to have just vanished very mysteriously and quickly, and uh, it seemed appropriate. So I was able to marry that with some music that I had written in the past and uh, and came up with this piece that I'm very pleased with. I love it. I love it. Now, okay, so you seem to have a fascination with transportation in some way then, when it comes from the Mary Celeste, right? <laughs> and then Charles Lindbergh um, on, on a previous album, apparently, Faith <laughs> Science, that you have a little um, bit going on in Europe. You like to, you're just into a big trip, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well spotted. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know about that so much. I, re- I read a book on Lindbergh, and I was fascinated by his life. He led a, yeah. quite an extraordinary life. And I thought for that album, for for Face Science, I could hang a lot of the things I wanted to say and write about on the arc of that life. Mm. And um, that was really, you know, the, uh, the impetus or whatever. And I actually, it sort of faded a bit because, I mean, you can go back and you can hear, I think you can connect all the dots and find, you know, all the bits of his life in there. But um, I didn't necessarily stick to it in the end. It sort of faded a bit. <laughs> It changes. Mm. I think when you create, the process takes you on a journey in a way. You know, with this album, did that happen? Did you have, like, this is how, you know, this is what I'm going to do, and then did it change as you start creating it? Or did this, were these songs that you'd written over time? Yeah, um, well, a little both, I guess. It's it's always evolving. It's always changing. I mean, you do have to have, I think, a, a game plan, like a clear picture. I knew that... Um, I wanted to I wanted to produce an album that could be on vinyl. So already mm-hmm. that's a you know a format restriction of cool. you know I can only do so many minutes of music because this limited edition vinyl is going to come out. So that kind of paints you in a little corner. But having said that, um there were lots of things that were done. Uh, I tried to find the balance between structure and improvisation. And so lots of things like in the song that you heard were really, you know, thought out and written out pieces, but then there were plenty of moments, especially in the solo sections, even the violin melody, I had just improvised once, and I sent it to the violinist, and I said, you know, do whatever you want. This is just a place to start. And he basically followed the idea, the you know, he, he added a little bit into his instrument and how he would play it and perform it. But um, that's kind of a balance that I'm, tr- I'm striving to find. And so if you're improvising it's always going to bring a fresh element to whatever you're doing. Yeah, I think you use the phrase, paint yourself into a corner. You know, when you first hear that, you think, yeah, you know, that then now you're boxed in, you have to do things a certain mm-hmm. way. But if you think about it even a little bit deeper, then you've, you might come up with the idea that you have to be ultra, ultra creative mm-hmm. to get out of that corner. So in a way, being painted into a corner makes you more creative. Mm-hmm. That's a it's an interesting way of putting it. You know, um I like the idea um of certain challenges. And so initially when I started pre-production on this album, I was going to play everything a la Paul McCartney on his first mm-hmm. album or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um and I was keen to especially to to really woodshed on my drumming skills because they're, you know, I'm just a beginning drummer, but you know, anyone could play anything I've ever drummed. It's not not mm-hmm. that challenging, but but I was keen to to have a you know go at it, and um, and I started demoing the album, and I realized I, I was missing the input of others, 
And so that was something else that changed. It morphed pretty quickly into the process that I was going to pull in people for sort of cameo appearances. I'm still playing a lot of the instruments, but it was important to have those people participate and also just have, you know, the feedback, right, you know, immediate with that person um, that ended up being very important to this process. Mm. I think it is important. You know, that's the thing Nancy was talking about, painting and authors, I mean, artists, you know, because she's, she's an artist and it, it's very solitary compared to musicians having that feedback. Some musicians, that's that's how they play. It is just one right. big collaborative process in a way. It's like... Well, for a band especially. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I only know of one instance of all the interviews and, and things that we've done where... Um, a husband and wife painted on the same picture. And oh, wow. It, I know. It's easy. That's your reaction right there. I've right? Never, it's like, unimaginable, a group of actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. I, yeah, I wonder how many arguments there were. But it, <laughs> right. when, when you have an idea of somebody else painting on your picture, it yeah, seems yeah. really bizarre. But now in, in music, collaboration artists don't they it's different like yeah. a whole orchestra gets together and and makes a piece of music but i think when there's like complicated murals in some historic elements there there could be painters who all painted different parts of a mural that could have happened yeah that that is that's happened i know diego yeah. um yeah. rivera and orozco jose orozco but, you know done that. contemporary times it's like if you're painting a picture and somebody comes up you don't even like them to comment it's like let's just <laughs> nice don't say anything it's like writing novels together that's the same thing writing a book together yeah i know there's co-authors but even that like how do you do that you know so it's interesting so yeah. so how long did this you know, come together, and I know you you recorded this at Paradise Studios, right, with Craig Long. Tell us tell us about That's that. Right. Um, Craig is someone I've known for many years, and in fact, uh, my very first professional recording was done at his studio. So we won't say how many years ago that was. Uh, that um, he he's worked with big big names. I'm you know from local acts like Tesla or whatever who are still platinum, but he's worked with people like Prince, you know, Bobby mm-hmm. Brown, whoever. Mm-hmm. I mean huge international yeah. act. And he lives, I joke, and I told you earlier, that he lives five minutes away and I will tease him, you know, well, the only reason I go is because you're just five minutes away. <laughs> Which, <laughs> it's it's nice, it's very convenient, but he's brilliant at what he does. And I really wanted someone who, as I recorded the vocals especially, you know, had that expertise. And I was in his hands, and I could trust him, you know. If he said, you know, try this harmony or, you know, accent this consonant or whatever it was, you Mm -hmm. know, I'd be willing to try it. And we'd go to the ends of the earth, and I have to say I'm really very pleased with the way the vocals turned out. That's that's something that I'm – and he was actually a part of the, um, the final mix and mastering process, which is so important. I know there's. Uh, I, I want to play some more music, but um, I know that you've also, you know, you're part of different bands like the Mangoes. Now, okay, you know, my favorite fruit, right? <laughs> but so, do, do you play this okay. music out? Uh, do you perform it? Do you perform it in Sacramento, where you're based? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Um, so, you, we're getting back to what you were saying about the interaction that will happen musically between musicians. It's been a little while, unfortunately, since I've been in a band, and I just had an album release party just in this last week. And so I thought, because the you know space was kind of limited, it'd be fun to have um, another musician involved. And so I pulled in my friend Jim Hefter, who's a great drummer, and he participated in a couple bands I've been in. And uh, and so we did kind of an interesting duet where I played guitar and sang and played keyboards, and he played percussion to it. And immediately, uh, like you were, I was falling in love with the idea of playing with other musicians again because mm-hmm. it's been a while. Um, I haven't had a working band for a while, um, so I, you know, I'd love to play it out. It hasn't happened very much that I've been playing this mu- this, this original music out, but um, but it's a lovely thing, you know, to connect with an mm-hmm. audience. It's um, sometimes the other things can bog you down a bit, you know. If you've worked all day, you got to load up the gear, get there, do yeah. the sound check, all that. You know, playing for the the audience is the heavenly part, right? Yeah. But. Um, it's mm-hmm. true. But, but, yeah, perhaps true. more in the in the next year. I know about lugging gear, man. Mm-hmm. I just 
Has it got any easier? You know, because I remember just no. we had, a, we had a, a rock band for a few years in San Diego, and and it's hard I work. mean, and then and just corralling the cats. You know, I'm serious. It was like hurting and making sure everyone was there on time. And then if you were right. the person like me who booked the gig and and the, you uh-huh. know, you were it was happy. all on your shoulders, right? And yeah. yeah, and then all the people hiring us were advertisers in our print publication back in the day. Then, and it was like behave yourself. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, it's a reflection you know, on you. Yeah, I know uh, yeah. when I was tearing down from uh, the, the release party, a buddy was helping me load up my car, and he said, you know you really made it when you have a roadie. And I said, you're not wrong. <laughs> I know, right? I know. It's like because that gear, it would be you like used one. 2, 3 in the morning. <laughs> That's the worst thing, and there's that temptation to leave it in your car, and you know better. Uh-huh. You, can't. you know what I'm talking oh, yeah. about. You're I know at that exactly point. what you're talking about. You're just like, no, and you're like, yeah, you better do it, you know. It's, it's. I mean, the one time we left ours in the car for yep. a split yep. second, we yep. weren't even done. We weren't even, I mean, we did this New Year's gig out in the desert in uh, San Diego and at a horse ranch, and <laughs> we all came back. We were like just, you know, it, we looked like we had been out in the desert. And <laughs> we came back, and I wanted to run upstairs, take a quick shower, and then take the bass player home. Yeah. And so everything was in the car, and all of a sudden, a carport fire happened, and we were living in these apartments. We had just gotten there to San Diego, and everything blew up. The car blew up. His new, oh brand God. new base yeah. blew up. I mean, brand Our new next to it brand up. new PA, everything. I had a whole file of written, and this was, you know, before Google and everything, handwritten lyrics and everything. Everything went up oh, in smoke. Oh, the car, irreplaceable stuff, too. Yeah. It was crazy. We thought... I don't know. We thought we were being bombed, you know. Yeah, because it was like it, Baghdad or something. Was something was going on, and we're like, <laughs> like oh, oh, my God. You I know? was just waiting <laughs> to hear that you've been broken into. <laughs> no, no. We just, we totally, everything blew up. I mean, all the car tires and gas cap. I mean, it was crazy. But uh, wow. luckily, no one was hurt. We should it, say that. It but started with it, one, I one little old lady drove her car in, and she had a gas She was from leave. Pasadena. Yeah. <laughs> and she drove okay. her car slowly. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, exactly. So the question is, do the insurance replace all of that gear? No, no. Uh, Live and learn. Live and live learn. And learn about is, I learned companies. everything the oh, the hard way. I really uh, did. I, you know, I just thought, oh well, it's gear, blah blah blah. Oh, I didn't realize you need to insure your gear separately. I didn't understand like any of that. And Matt, had, our bass player had just, I mean, it was a New Year's Day gig, New Year's Eve, and he had mm. just had got this brand new, oh, is it, um... Uh, You're breaking my heart. <laughs> it was, what is, you know Taylor Guitars and Carbon? Yeah. He just, yeah, mm-hmm. he had just brand new bass from them, and it was like, oh, it wasn't, it was Carbon. There was a, anyway, he yeah, was a sure. factory in San Diego, and this was his big dream, and it yeah. was heartbreaking, man, for all of us. And then yeah. everybody just... It's almost like a sign from God for this band to disband. It did. It, it did. did. <laughs> After that, it was. It was Because then we found out our rhythm guitarist was a rapist. and he, for, yes. Oh, my God. You know, the other one was stuck on drugs. The other one oh, got a DUI and stole his Marine base van, and you know. Oh, yeah, no, so, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, no, it was it, time yeah. for that band to end. That was <laughs> you a have sign. That was warning. A, it was a big <laughs> sign, a loud one. Oh, now, okay, speaking of memories, the one song, My Alley, I, 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 I love that, My Alley. Um, my Alley, that song takes me back to my childhood. I had a friend, Robbie, oh, who since passed, uh, sadly, but oh. he, he, it was, you know, it, we were like bad little kids. You, were you know, we were, just, we were very mischievous. His parents were uh, abandoned in South. This is in South Africa, and her, his parents were abandoned. So Nancy was in the ho- same hotel where they, you know, doing her art. And then here's his his family. You know, was the family band, and him and I would run around crazy and get on bicycles and go torment people and um, and this and and just. We would talk about the world and you know make pacts and do all kinds of crazy things. And this right. song reminds me of him so much. As, as soon, I, it made me so happy. Tell us about this song. Is this about a childhood friend or? Yeah, yeah, it's a true story actually. I uh, I was writing, you know, again songs coming different ways. I was writing on guitar and I came up with the chords, you know, that were really kind of strident and upbeat and happy. And I was thinking, okay, what's this song about? And it seemed like the 
the song was about friendship, and I thought, okay, well, there's my entry. Where where am I going with this? And I thought about again, like you're saying, I don't know how old you were with that particular friendship when you met that person, but I was about nine, ten years old when I met. Yeah, yeah, when, yeah. You know, yep, that's the, right. Yeah, it. you have your your <laughs> schoolyard friends or whatever, you know, and your neighbors or whatever. But this is someone I really bonded with. His yeah. name was Howard, and we got on like a house on fire. You know, it was the first time I'd really bonded with someone in that way, and so all of the things that are talked about in that song are are true story. I mean, I was in his treehouse. We looked at the telescope. All of that, you know, is very. It's true to life, and I'm I'm, I'm actually the most pleased with that lyric. That uh, I feel like it, it captures. It's a nice snapshot of of that time. That uh, you know, those years. Don't don't mm-hmm. we miss those years, the treehouse years? <laughs> no we used to slide off the roof. <laughs> we used to slide off roofs. We used to yeah we yeah we do. It was so much fun. But we would right? think about where we were going to be when we were older. Later, I found out um, that he was a musician too, and I didn't know that. You know, we split ways um, just because we lived in different countries and right. Um, we didn't split. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. But. But um, you know, we did reunite when when I was we were both teenagers, and then it was really odd. It was like you know because well, now we're girl boy, awkward. you know, and it was like oh, we looked at oh, each yeah, other. Course, yeah. So the tomboy stage had passed, but not really, it's still there. But it was <laughs> it like, like weird because he's just like you're wearing makeup. <laughs> 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 What's that on your eyes? What happened to you? You know. But it took a we like yeah, the families are all talking. My mom's with you know his parents and everything, and then him and I are just like looking at each other like, what happened to you? <laughs> right. This is different. Yeah. There's you a great line um, in now. Stand by Me, the Stephen King book, exactly. where he's talking about how um, you know no one really has a friend like they do in the fourth grade or whatever. That oh. that those friendships are are so special and enduring. And you do crazy mm-hmm. things. You really oh, yeah. do crazy things. There's, there's well, you you dare each other. Yeah, running through the woods and you yeah. BB guns and doing <laughs> no, it no. Sounds like there's very similar experiences. Yeah. Awesome. Let's play it. Are you ready to play yes, it? Yes, please. Everyone, yes. my ally, not Ellie. <laughs> Just have another <laughs> sip of champagne. It'll be good. <laughs> Here right. it is. Everyone, go get it from timmorris.com. And I knew that I had found 
listening to Big Blend Radio, and that was my ally, and it is by Tim Morris on his third album. You can go get it at timmorris.com, Amazon, iTunes, CD Baby, and Tim is here with us. Tim, so January uh, 2019 is when the vinyl's out? That's right. It's very exciting. I just got yeah. the uh, test pressing of the vinyl last week, and I have to tell you, it was such a thrill to put that needle on and listen to. I mean, that's been the dream of mine since I've been 13 to put out mm-hmm. a record, you know? Awesome. Mm-hmm. And yeah. plus, it sounds great on vinyl. So Yeah, you know what? I'm so it's excited. Amazing. I'm so excited for the revival of vinyl. I don't mm-hmm. think it ever really went away. It was just in the commercial zone because people who love vinyl treasure their vinyl. It's like, you know, you're... People have, you know, libraries. We all tend to be the same people. If we have a lot of books, we're going to have a lot of vinyls. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, you know, it's funny because a few years ago, you know, I might have poo-pooed it a bit and said, well, you know, there's no appreciable difference, da 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 and, and as it turns out at that time, my, my turntable was down, so I finally replaced it, and I thought, okay, well, let's, you know, give it a test drive. So I pulled out a copy of Yes, Fragile, and I put it on, turned up the volume, and was blown away by how incredible this sounded, you know, that analog warmth. Everything Mm. about it, just, you know, the tactile experience, the the gateful cover, you know, all of it. Mm. I I like that it's 20 minutes-ish, and there's an intermission, you know, instead of some endless, faceless MP3 that plays forever. Yeah. There's there's so much that's kind of intoxicating about vinyl. One of the musicians we know, Ryan David Orr, that's been on our show a few mm-hmm. times, Nancy, yes. he's putting out his new album, and he's going to do vinyl, and, you know, of course, the digital downloads and everything, yeah. um, but he's now looking at doing cassettes, and he goes, <laughs> oh, wow, and I'm like, dude, seriously, like, that, I, I'm a fan of old cassettes, I'm just weird that way, because... It, there's like this thing. I don't know. Because, you know, you And you be can able do to that now, too. It's funny to think. I was joking. For a minute, I was thinking, I'll do it every format. I'll have cassette and a track and, you know, everything. Mm. <laughs> and then, you know, common sense sort of reared yeah. its head. But, but it's great. You know, however people want to enjoy music, please, you know, do that. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just this cool. And I think your style of music, it, to me, I want to sit down and have a nice glass of wine and just trip out for a while and and just to do it with a really good record player, good sound system and not have any neighbors tell me what to do. Oh, but, you know. <laughs> that's what I like about listening to music in a car. Uh-oh. But that's hard. Do you guys think about that when you're mastering the sound about how it's going to be in a car, how it's going to play in a car? Yeah, you do have to think about all those scenarios. And in fact, when I did my very first album, Transformation, my producer, Mark Dean, would, would listen to it in every kind of format, like you're saying. He'd listen to it in mm. his car. He'd listen to it in a boombox, all of that. I mean, ultimately, yeah, you want it to be heard on the best system possible. But the reality of it is that, you know, a lot of people mm. are going to listen to it as you know, an MP3 in earbuds or, you know, on computer speakers. And so you, have to, you do have to be aware of that and account mm. for that. What's really interesting about your album is I know there's – prog rock progressive rock i'm not good with all the labeling but to me you have a lot of different genres in there you have a lot of jazz you got some funky cool like bluesy just really badass piano in there that i'm just like that is cool (laughs) like i feel like i'm in a smoky jazz bar and now i'm going to pick up smoking again um i'll do it no i won't (laughs) but i just feel like there's these settings where you really are in different places and it's like you know, listening to an album, like I said, it takes you on a journey. It takes you to different places in your life. And for it to be able to flow, to me, there's just such a talent. I get so excited when you get to sit down with an album and be able to be surprised, yet the element of surprise flow can continue into something else and flow. That's a real talent to have that happen. Oh, thank you. It is. I mean, that's a big consideration. And actually, unlike a lot of people, I do – I almost always have the sequence mapped out before I even start recording. It's very important to me what you're saying, that there's that journey and there is that flow, and that's not something that I just do, you know, willy-nilly at the last second go, oh, okay, this will be the opening song or whatever. No, (laughs) I've known for a long time it was going to be Wake Up. 
you know, the other thing too, you know, wake up. That that's it. The very first song. Mm-hmm. It it that takes me to India, and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. now I'm, I'm getting this. But it's not overdone. That's what I'm saying. That you've got these little subtleties that make you think as a listener that you become part of the experience. That's the important key. Well, that sounds spice. great to me. I'm very very pleased to hear that. I'm hungry now. I'd like some wine. I want to sm- apparently smoke. Come on, I you know, that was well, coming. That's because, you know, my ally, uh, that, that's so funny because, you know, it took me to, you, know, you said, stand by me. And now, I'm like, I just see, you know, River Phoenix. And, and I'm just like, I want to go walk the railroad tracks now. <laughs> It's well, so the cool. visual part of it's important, and, and like you were sa- you were talking about, I guess like a smoky jazz club or something. And I was thinking of the marquee. Yeah, the which marquee, absolutely. I was talking to someone last night about the idea of doing a video, which I'm hoping to shoot in the next month, which would mm, be almost cool. exactly what you've described. You know, it would be kind of a jazz club with the people you know involved in recording it, um, and you know, it'd be black and white and have that like. 40s or 50s jazz club vibe. I like that. Which, Ooh. Yeah, it sounds like you were already there kind of picturing it. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, I like that. I like that. I, that's exactly it. Now we'll have to have cognac for that one. Just <laughs> okay. I'm, and just now you're going to ask for a cigar or something. <laughs> Apparently there's a cocktail where you can have champagne and co- cognac together. You I've never tried that. Ooh. I don't no, know. I, I can't say I, that I have. I don't know that that really sounds good. I know. It doesn't sound scary. All doesn't that, that good. sound scary to yeah. you? Like to no, me, that no. yuck. My I don't think on any. That. Listen, champagne. I don't even think you should put orange juice in it. it should just always no. be, you know, let the bubbles be pure and let free. Let them be what they are. Yeah, save the <laughs> bubbles. <laughs> save okay. the bubbles. <laughs> so, uh, so wake up takes you into that. You know that it's like a spiritual open up. Open up your third eye. I like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's that yeah. part. The labyrinth, that's where that piano, it's like the labyrinth and the marquee like kind of go together to me. They're just like this. If you were ever just going to do, you know, one, you know, the side A and B, those two should be together, <laughs> the labyrinth and the marquee. Yeah, they, they seem to, again, fit, like yeah. you were saying, in terms of the flow. And you have kind of a, you know, the labyrinth is a big, heavy piece that has all those twists and turns, semi pun intended. Um, that you have some some relief with the marquee. I mean, I always thought that there was um, this kind of a tongue-in-cheek aspect to it that kind of diffuses a little bit of the heaviness of Labyrinth. Mm. So what is your champagne toast? Ah, my champagne toast. Well, yeah. as you may have heard, we've had quite the fires and you yeah. know, mm. issues over here, and I, I'd love to toast our brave firefighters. Who yes. you know they've given so much and worked so hard to put out these recent fires, and um, you know they risk so much. Their job is overwhelming. I I just appreciate them all. So this glass of champagne is for you. Yeah, here, I'm here. with you. I'm with you on that. Um, That's for sure. They're amazing. They're it's, amazing. And the fires really are. are are getting harder and harder to fight, and hotter and hotter and yeah. faster and faster. And um, yeah, everyone. Just, the firefighters are incredible, the first responders. And, and you see so many stories come out of the, you know these devastating times, but you also see these just amazing stories, positive things, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's hard yeah. to, to so, get that, so many of that them, yeah. balance, you know, between it all. Well, they didn't have very much, you know, relief and no downtime. You know, it's got to be it's really just horrific. Brutal. Yeah, yeah. It, some of the uh, photos you see, it looks like it's mm, just Hades, you know, yeah. that they're trying to – tackle this insurmountable, you know, Herculean task. And yet mm, they've yeah. done it. Again, bless them. And they mm. keep going back. Mm. Yes. You know? Well, I've I've got one more question for you before we, okay. we play music. Um, we have to play Circle Talisman. I just, when okay. anybody puts the word talisman, I'm in. I'm in. And then, <laughs> then you listen to the music, you're like, I'm really I'm just going to name all my songs Talisman. <laughs> okay. Talisman 1. Tim talisman, talisman album series. <laughs> there it is. I like that. <laughs> That, there was that song. That, oh my gosh, um, that it got me stuck into that whole mindset of talisman. Oh come on, the the band new Mother Nature taken over. Uh, yeah. Uh, the guess who? Is it guess who? Guess who did that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No sugar tonight in my coffee. Yeah. No sugar tonight <laughs> in my tea. Okay. So that yeah, that, they did the song talisman, and you rarely hear it or see it, but it's it's cool. Um, Yes, 
stories and uh, writing classic rock stories. When did the writing bug hit you? Was it was it playing fragile and on? on <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the writing bug hit me. It's funnily enough, right around the time I became a musician, I started really getting into writing, and um, it started to manifest in different ways. I did a lot of um, stream of consciousness sort of writing, but also writing for mm. school newspapers and that sort of thing. And um, oh, wow. And yeah, so I I was and I still am a big fan of Yes, and there was only one book that came out on them called The Authorized Biography. It came out in 1980, I believe. And I thought, well, someone's got to update this book at some point, and no one ever did. And finally, I said, right then, I'm doing it. And oh. uh, and I was very fortunate that the St. Martin's Press saw the validity in doing it, um, and they they published both that book and classic rock stories. And they were both enormously successful, and I was able to parlay it into a whole freelance writing career as well. So um, it's what? just been, oh, nice. yeah, blessing mm-hmm. after blessing as far as you know, yes stories that that really opened a lot of doors. So now, when you do freelance writing, uh, where where is your work published, and are you writing specifically on music? Um, yeah, it's almost always music based and um it's a lot of you know a lot of different periodicals and some online publications as well um more recently i've written for the the magazine called progression which has to do with progressive rock music mm. and oftentimes it'll be bands that i feel deserve some notice you know although sometimes uh, i went to go see kate bush in 2014 i flew over to see oh, the yeah. shows uh, yeah, it was mm. extraordinary, and so I felt like I needed to document that experience, and so I wrote yes. the reviews of those shows. Yeah, um, so uh, it depends. I'm I'm looking at doing a piece on the jazz pianist Hiromi in the coming year, um, but yeah, you know, personal favorites or things I really want to champion, I'll I'll write about that. That's fantastic, you know, because does it does it affect your writing in music? Be, from because when you write you know, you become analytical, you know, you're more observant, I think. There's something about that. Does that affect your, your actual writing for your music? Um, that's an interesting point. I don't know if I've considered it that way. I guess there's um, there's probably like this mechanical, it's the streak, you know, of, of being detail-oriented or obsessed any way that comes out, whether it's in my, you know, my writing or my composing of music that, um, you know, I want to see it through. I'm not just going to go, well, that's close enough, or whatever. Mm. There's so many words out there. I know. You know, and the the rewriting that happens, whether it's music or or a, a novel or an article, it's just sometimes the word, the right word says it all, and mm-hmm. then there's other times where you have like 10 to 15 words, and you're like, this isn't really exactly what I mean, but the word won't come, you know, for a while. Make your own. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, <laughs> The, 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 again, the emotional content is the the big the big thing here. Whether it's in my in my writing or my music comp- compositions, I you know I want the emotion to be right. And um, mm-hmm. you know, if you you fiddle with it, you play with either the music or, or the writing long enough, you'll get it into a place where you feel like this is this is the message I want to create that I want to present to the world. Right yeah. on. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you've got to remember that. Every time you do music, you write something, and, and it's out there, you're responsible for it. <laughs> you've got, you're, you're yes, responsible I suppose for that's your, true. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like that's – I, you know, I look at the world of social media now and, and how it can be positive or negative, and there's days where you just want to go, you know, on, you know, especially with all the political stuff going on, you want to, you know and, – and I go, no um, – once I have my three. My it, rule. My rule is: you either educate, <laughs> inspire, or enlighten. You know that you have to. It, it's got to like be. That. Yeah. yeah, you've got to. It's got to be positive. It's got to be positive. Whatever you put out there, or entertain is my other one. Um, so if I'm going to get mad, it'll be at least entertaining <laughs> for people. That's how I look at it. <laughs> so yeah, those are the three E's. But um, we're going to play Circle Talisman. You want to tell us about that? Um, okay, yeah, Circle was a little instrumental piece that I had that just wanted to be an introduction to a song, and so it had been lying mm-hmm. around for a while waiting for a home, 
Um, but I, it was actually the very first thing I recorded for the album, and I had done these guitars um, and found out that two old friends, um, that they had passed away recently. And so it seemed to inform that music that I was thinking, Circle is that like um, your spirit is sort of this endless thing, this circle that goes on, you know, whether it's this life, the next life, whatever. Mm. And um, I ended up mirroring it with Talisman, which um, is a song, it's, it's a song about longing, but it's also a song about intention. And mm. that if you're putting out that positivity and you're, you're looking for it, that eventually, you know, the planets will align, the stars will align or whatever, and this will come true. So mm. um, it's definitely about seeking, you know, that person, that soulmate or whatever in your life. And then when it does happen, how powerful it's, it's magical, you know. Beautiful. It's a beautiful mm. piece. I love it. I love the instrumentation and the words, the lyrics. I, I just, I love it. Um, everyone, again, uh, you can go to timmorris.com. And uh, also the album, Tim Morse 3, is out on CD Baby, iTunes, Amazon. And uh, watch for the, um, the album coming out January 2019. And the best thing is to, for everyone to go to your website for that, right? Um, that's definitely a place where they can go. You know, any information about the, web or, uh, about the music can be found there. Awesome, awesome. And again, we want to thank the National Parks Arts Foundation uh, for sponsoring this segment. You can go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. Tim, if you were going to spend a month in a national park, where would it be? If you can just to create and write music. You should do <laughs> That's this. That's a great creative. question. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, I went to Yellowstone a few years ago, and I, I could see how you could spend a month there easily. Oh, yeah. So um, I'll go with that as my answer for right now. Awesome, awesome. Here it is, everyone. More than a month. I know. We have to go live there. (laughs) Yeah, we're getting ready for that. Uh, Everyone, here it is, Circle Talisman. Thanks so much for joining us, Tim, and Champagne Toast to your new album. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Totally, totally a great pleasure. Here it is, everyone.